Um, I, I think in this section I'm going to talk more practical. So if there are any filmmakers out, out in the audience, um, some of this information is geared towards you, talking about how to make these, these films, the complexities, the opportunities, and the challenges. Um, so just to recap what, what Denise said, kind of um, the goal in these, in these films, um, you know, from my perspective, I'm a, I'm a filmmaker, a documentary filmmaker, and a journalist. And so I focus on uh, nonfiction in general. And so the goal is to help audiences um, you know, uh, immerse themselves in a new environment. And, and it, there's, there's two overarching ways to do that. One is to create immersion, the sense of being somewhere else. And then the other way is to create presence. This is a, these are terminologies that, that are kind of used in the virtual reality community. Presence is the sense that you really believe that you're somewhere else. Presence can, can also include um, smell, sound, uh, tactile, haptic sensations. So some of these presentations that we saw in Denny's imply picking objects up with a headset. So you're really immersed in a room. And if you move forward, um, the video moves forward with you and you have this feeling that you're totally somewhere else. 360 video is, is much simpler in a way. You don't, um, you don't have so you don't have the ability to, um, um, to interact directly with the environment in 360 film. And that's shown on like Facebook, on YouTube, or on your mobile phone, more as a passive observer. But also you can mix all of that together. So just, to, just as a summation. So for us, as, as journalists, why do we want to do VR journalism? One, you know, one of the main advantages to that is, is location you can bring the audience into an area that they would never be able to go to. That, that can be a war zone, that could be a weather disaster, that could be just any place on the other side of the world. VR really provides you with a good opportunity to do that. So just to give you a, a clip, I want to show you from um, a film I did in South Sudan. Um, as many of you might know, South Sudan has been um, in the midst of a civil war for the past, since, you know, for the past five, six years. Um, you know, millions of people are displaced, tens of thousands have died, um, and it's consistently on the brink of famine. Um, every year during the lean season, people are on the verge of starvation um, because of the disruption that's caused by civil war. So we wanted to take this new technology and help explain a somewhat complex situation, bring people to South Sudan through, this, through the headset. So I'll just give you the... Um, what you're going to see is the first two minutes of the film um, in which uh, a United Nations team is distributing food. This plane is taking food to remote villages in South Sudan's lowland swamps. It's the rainy season, and roads are washed out. The only way to get food here is to drop it from the sky. getting a glimpse of a challenge, a major challenge in, in VR filmmaking. Uh, one is the technology. It's fairly clunky um, and it's very expensive. Um, 
So let me see. Yeah. Um, and I just, I just, for the sake of any filmmakers, for the sake of any filmmakers who are interested in making VR or 360 films, I want to give a kind of a really brief summary of the technology. How do you make it? If that's okay. These are some of the consumer level cameras. Um, you know, the cost is between 300 and 1,000 um, dollars. This is kind of the mid professional cameras. Uh, that you know, from from the one on the left, they cost around five thousand dollars. This one is the top end, and it's a hundred thousand dollars. So, just to give you an example of how the, uh, how difficult it is to make, most people can't afford a hundred thousand uh, dollar camera. Um, Denny's talked about Clouds Over Sidra. It's that's the film that uh, was shown in Davos. It brought people to a Syrian refugee camp. I know Gabbo when when he originally shot that film. It cost $100,000 per minute. Just, just, I mean, that's super expensive. The cost, and that was in 2015, the cost now is substantially less. You can make uh, a film now on your own. It's very much possible for um, independent filmmakers to do this. Um, there's also the importance of surround sound. You want to, when you create immersion, um, you have to learn new types of techniques that involve um, 360 sound. Most filmmakers are not trained in how to record 360 sound. Um, but now that's becoming built into all these systems. It's very, very important. Sound is, is almost equally, equally as important as the, as the visuals when you are immersed in order to create that sense of presence. So the other major challenge apart from directing, apart from um, uh, equipment, is directing. W the way you make direct, uh, 360 films or virtual reality films is it's, it's capturing all of the um, environment. It's capturing top, bottom, left, right, forward, backward. And if you, if you don't want to be in the film yourself, you have to press record and leave the room. So that means that you can't necessarily watch what's happening and you can't control it. That can be an opportunity as well, but often there are accidents that happen. This is, for instance, when we were in a refugee camp in South Sudan, um, we, would leave the, we would leave the camera, the camera rolling, only to discover later when we were going through the footage that people you know, had, pressed the, had started touching it and pressing the buttons and stuff. And this is a, a, a screenshot from it. Um, the other, obviously, is the danger. That is, you know, it's not, it's still about a, you know, an $8,000 camera and a 70 kilo bag almost landed on it. But we thought it was worth it for that shot because it was kind of cool. Um, also, there's, there's just a degree of, you can show, you can see the chaos that, that you know, filming in, in the field in a place like South Sudan in Africa. Oh, they can't hear us. Yeah, let me try this one again. How about this one? Um, filming in, a, in the field for any, in any medium, it can be very chaotic. If you're not there to control it, it's really hard. I mean, in, in South Sudan, just to give you an example, there were hundreds of children all around us. And this, this sense of chaos is really difficult to work with. And this is another shot from the film. So another thing I want to talk about is integrating. Um, how do you integrate historical footage in in uh, in um, in virtual reality? That's a really big challenge that Denny's and I both face. You you worked on a film that you can maybe talk about as well that integrates historical footage, um, and it, you know in order to create that sense of presence, I just want to show you a clip from um, a film that I made integrating. Uh, historical footage of colonial uh, Congo and disease, and how, how we did that. The late 1920s saw the first epidemic of sleeping sickness of the 20th century. As many as one in four Central Africans were infected, tens of thousands died. At the time, all right, so the sound is, is, is quite low, so I'm just going to talk you through it. Basically, this is a kind of a, 
uh, a mixed medium uh, VR situation. So I filmed in 360 a classroom, and, uh, and an animator integrated the film and projected it into the virtual environment. It's very hard to get information, too much information in, in VR. It's often the viewer is completely overwhelmed. If you give them too much information, they can't process it. They're stimulated so much through, um, through their, their, their eyes and their ears. Um, and so one of the ways to do that is, is through animation. Let's see. Sorry. How do I do this one? So uh, before, I, before we move on, I just want to talk about one more thing. One of the main advantages of, of, of 360 video and virtual reality is to create a sense of intimacy. One of the most impactful ways to make a film is to create a sense of trust between the audience and a character in the film. Um, and there's a new film that just came out that was also done by Gabo um, that brings a Holocaust survivor back to Auschwitz to talk about their experience. And this is something we can talk about in the Q&A, about kind of the ethics of that and how they did that. But the audience basically was able to go back to Auschwitz with a survivor, and the survivor can talk to the audience member directly through the virtual reality headset about the experience that they lived through. So I just want to show a, a two minute clip from that. Um, it was just released this year. Um, and it stars um, Pincus, his, his name is Pincus, I can't remember his last name. He lost his family in Auschwitz, he survived, and he has gone back uh, in the past with visitors as, a, as an educational um, program that he runs regularly. He worked with the filmmaker to do this um, fairly complex film. Partly it's 360 video, partly it is a CG recreated uh, film, and you're going to see this. So obviously this is not um, a video, this is uh, generated by computer. When we were pushed into those wagons to take us to the east, we didn't know where we were going. I come back to Majdanek, to this camp, to convey the truth of what actually happened. This place, this camp, was a place of torture. I think that you have to confront pain to be able to heal it. Unless you have somebody that can say, I was here, I saw this, this was done to me. I don't think people would accept it as the gospel truth. So I think that's a good place for me to end. Um, what's happening here is there's a relationship that's being, um, there's a relationship that's developing between the, the viewer and the subject, Pincus. And I don't know if how many people here have put on a headset, but it's very common for an audience to feel that the person is actually speaking to them directly. It's not a passive interaction like with TV, you know, where you, you, the, the TV the character is talking to someone off screen. What, what I think um, is a very effective use of VR is, um, is when you have something like this.